creating a diet based on the bioenergetic view can be difficult, but in this episode, we're going to make it easy by laying out the exact foods that make up a bioenergetic diet. This is episode 101 of the Energy Balance Podcast, a podcast where we explore health and nutrition from the bioenergetic view and teach you how to maximize your cellular energy to maximize your health. This episode is part two of a two-part series on building a bioenergetic diet. And in today's episode, we'll be going over why you want to avoid vegetarian-fed chicken and acorn-fed pork. We'll be discussing the best bioenergetic fat, protein, and carb sources. We'll be discussing why it's best to avoid salmon and bluefin tuna and what fish and seafood to have instead. We'll also be discussing whether we should be including vegetables and fiber in our diet, how to avoid vegetable oils and what fats to use instead, and when it makes sense to include high FODMAP foods in our diet. As always, to check out the show notes for today's episode, you can head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast, where I'll link to the studies, articles, and anything else that we reference throughout today's episode. And with that, let's get started. Yeah, so I think that that's, uh, you know, enough as far as guidelines for creating meals, timing between meals, and all of that. I do want to talk about some specifics as far as food suggestions go. And so this involves where we want to be getting our protein and fat and carbs from, which sources are ideal, which are going to be best from the metabolic standpoint, which could provide, you know, could create some issues, which are the things that we generally want to avoid. We'll talk through it all now. We've we've done this and, you know, we, we have talked through sources for these different foods at different points in the past. But I also have compiled all of this into a food guide infographic that you can download. And I would recommend that people go ahead and do that so at least they have it all laid out. You can print it out, and, uh, you know, just kind of see it very clearly. And it'll have a little bit more detail than we'll be able to discuss today because we're just talking through it. This way you don't have to take notes and everything as well. So to download that food guide, just head to jfeldmanwellness.com slash guide, G-U-I-D-E, and uh, you can go ahead and download that. I will mention also that on that food guide, I've got two separate scales. One is just kind of a general scale for how to consider these foods metabolically. And the other is how to consider these foods if you're having digestive issues, because those can be very different things as we talk about context. From the digestion side, something could be an issue, whereas if you digest it fine, it might be totally great. So uh, again, jfeldmanwellness.com slash guide to download that. And we'll start by going over the protein sources. So. A theme here uh, is maybe it's actually best to start with fat because protein is kind of informed by fat in that there are certain types of fats that we certainly want to avoid, and those are going to be the polyunsaturated fats. So from the fat side, we want to be favoring saturated and monounsaturated fats. And so our main sources here are going to be dairy fats like butter, ghee, cheese, milk, uh, fats from kind of nuts like coconut. Coconut oil is very saturated. Uh, we also have, as you mentioned, macadamia nuts which are very high in the monounsaturated and very low in the polyunsaturated as well. We also have other sources like cocoa butter, uh, beef tallow, palm kernel oil, and then olive oil, avocado, and palm oil, which do have a bit of polyunsaturated fats are generally about 10%. So still decent, way better than most of the high polyunsaturated fat oils, uh, but probably not the primary sources that you'd like to be getting your fat from. And hazelnuts would fall in that category too. As far as nuts go, they're much better than the others, but not quite as good as macadamia or coconuts. Uh, So that would be the main sources. Again, ruminant fats. So this is fats from whether it's beef or bison uh, or goat, those sorts of, or lamb, you know, those sorts of animals, dairy, coconut, coconut oil, palm kernel. Uh, Is there anything else you want to add as far as the ideal places to be getting your fats from? No, those would be the main ones that, I usually recommend for people. Um, I kind of separate the fats out a little bit less from ideal because I found some people will tol- do better with monos than they will with saturated. And it could be from like if they're having significant digestive issues. So in those so- circumstances, I also will include things like the uh, macadamia nuts, macadamia oil, like a good quality olive oil, possibly mm-hmm. some avocados, things like that, that, that I also find are okay. Um, and I the ideal perspective, I just to break it down for people here, dig into it a little bit more, is that is in terms of percent of uh, polyunsaturated fat content of those. So 
and per versus percent of uh, saturated fat, right? So the or the mono. primary sources that or monounsaturated yeah. fats. Yeah, so the primary sources that you listed were much higher in saturated and monounsaturated. Um, some of them like being very saturated, like coconut oil. Whereas the the secondary sources that I'm listing, with the exception of macadamia nut oil or macadamia nuts, do have a bit more uh, mono or polyunsaturated fats than the other sources that you mentioned. And hazelnuts would also fall into that category. Now, the only source of hazelnut. I usually recommend is Nutella, but that's <laughs> that's a different story. Which the Nutella actually has a better fatty acid profile than regular hazelnuts because they add palm oil and uh, cocoa butter and chocolate to it. So, yeah, right. Just as a side note, <laughs> there you go. Uh, but so, just to clarify, what you were saying the more monounsaturated base sources outside of macadamia. So this would be olive oil, avocado oil. Uh, in particular, and as you mentioned, hazelnuts, uh, those yep. are a bit higher in polyunsaturated fats than the first ones we mentioned, but they might do better yep. if somebody's having some trouble with digesting very saturated fats. Yep. Uh, we'll, we'll go through some of the more optimal sources from, we'll go through the protein and then carbs, and then we'll talk about the things that we generally want to avoid. So on the protein side, a lot of this is going to be informed by wanting to avoid the polyunsaturated fats. So we want to be getting protein sources from animal foods uh, that don't have a lot of polyunsaturated fats. This is going to be meat from ruminant animals. So we're talking beef, bison, lamb, a goat, all of, you know, sheep, th those kinds of things, uh, as well as pasture-raised chicken and pasture-raised pork that are not fed high poof of foods. So what that means is that if your chickens are vegetarian fed, meaning they're fed grains and seeds and things like that, Normally, that they're very high in polyunsaturated fats. If the pigs are fed, again, grains, or if they're fed acorns, you know, which are supposed to be so much better, these things are very high in polyunsaturated fats and will lead to meat that has very high poly polyunsaturated fats. So you really want to make sure these are uh, very good sources when it comes to chicken and pork. The one other way you can get around this is by getting very lean chicken and pork. So if you get chicken yeah. and pork without much fat, you don't have to worry about it being very polyunsaturated because you're not getting much fat. When it comes to the ruminant animals, you never have to worry about that regardless of what they're fed. So if you have a grain-fed cow, it will have more fat, but it's still going to be very highly saturated. There's going to be very little polyunsaturated fat in there, uh, even if it's fed all polyunsaturated fats. So that's something to consider when it comes to meat. When it comes to seafood, again, the same thing. We want to favor the very low polyunsaturated fat sources. Those would be shellfish, uh, you know, things like the crustaceans, you know, shrimp and lobster and crab, as well as the bivalves, you know, mollusks and oysters and clams, and then also the low fat fish. So fatty fish is always going to be very high in the polyunsaturated fats. Generally want to avoid those. And instead, and again, that includes the salmon that is touted as like the healthiest fish. Uh, and then we want to favor the low fat fish, lower polyunsaturated fat fish. This is going to be things like cod, flounder, Mahi Mahi, grouper, uh, snapper, halibut, haddock, pollock, and also most types of tuna except for bluefin tuna, which is pretty high in the polyunsaturated fats. Uh, there are a few other good protein sources. Mike, do you want to jump in on those? Yeah. So just on the fish too, something to keep in mind is I would also look at mercury content and heavy metal contents of the different yep. fish sources and then prioritize those as like your major sources and then kind of have secondary sources. So shrimp and scallops and then also the uh, like mollusks tend to be or bivalves as Jay mentioned. So that's like your clams, mussels, oysters, things like that tend to be a bit lower in heavy metals or and particularly mercury. Whereas your larger fish, your flounder and your cod tend to have a bit more mercury and then tuna more so than the flounder and the cod. But there's still flounder and cod still are technically on the lower side. Um, so yeah, so I would consider those things as well. I wouldn't eat large volumes of like heavy mercury fish on a regular basis. And the other thing you can look at is selenium content of some of these seafoods because there is a there's actually some research. I don't have the study pulled up right now, but they created a ratio between selenium content and mercury content of the different seafood. Um, and basically showing that the higher selenium to mercury ratio in the seafood has a somewhat of a beneficial effect on the mercury content because the mercury is competing for selenium at the selenoproteins. So that's important, but I'd still try to, even with that, minimize mercury as much as possible. And that'd be going for like shrimp is a great source 
of low mercury seafood. Seafood does have a ton of other nutrients and components and peptides and different proteins that are extremely beneficial for health. So I, would, I wouldn't shy away because I've had quite a few people like, oh, I'm not going to eat seafood because it has omega-3s. But I would, not, I would actually say, at least from my perspective, that eating seafood is probably better than not, even if you have, if you're getting some omega-3s from whatever your shrimp or oysters or mussels or scallops or whatever the deal is. Um, I think that there's tons of other benefits to the seafood just on a, a nutrient basis and then possibly some of these other more obscure compounds like furin fatty acids than like the downside of having some of the omega-3s present. Um, so that's something I just wanted to put in a little tangent there because it's quite important. As far as the other protein sources that I usually recommend, and I kind of see them as supplementary protein sources, but they can make life pretty easy. That's going to be your whey protein sources, possibly a casein if you, t- if you tolerate casein well, and then your collagen protein sources, collagen, gelatin, anything like that. And you can, those make life easy for a lot of people because you can build pretty nutrient dense shakes using fruit juice and then these different protein sources and, and maybe like throw in different, you can have a fat on the side, like chocolate or nuts or have something there and you can create complete meals out of these. So those, the whey and the collagen specifically do have some benefits, especially combined together. So if you're worried about building muscle or anything along those lines, whey can be quite helpful from that perspective. Uh, because it does have a high amount of leucine and it does stimulate muscle protein synthesis pretty well. And then collagen, besides balancing out some of the amino acids in whey, can be quite helpful from the perspective that it can it serves as a precursor for co- the formation of connective tissue. So combining your whey, the other thing is combining your whey and your collagen t- together provides you with a balanced amino acid profile that contains the three main amino acids. I think it's glutamine, cysteine, and... Um, uh, glycine for the formation of glutathione, which is one of the main antioxidants in the body. So you're providing precursors for it um, uh, using both of those proteins together. And then you're also providing for muscle protein synthesis as well as uh, connective tissue synthesis. So combining the whey and collagen can be helpful. And then something like casein, it does have special properties in terms of like a slow digesting process. So if you do tolerate casein, you don't have any problems with it, you can use casein overnight, which is like a traditional bodybuilding strategy, but you can use some casein, some carbohydrate, and a little bit of fat overnight that can help to stabilize blood sugar and help with sleep and things along those lines. So I think that those different protein sources can be quite helpful. And I think one other one that we missed was maybe eggs. I don't think we mentioned eggs, but eggs can be uh, quite a great protein source. And they're also the yolk, especially is very nutrient dense. It does have some uh, polyunsaturated fats in it, but um, if you get like pastured eggs and things like that, you can adjust the ratios, especially I would really avoid eating like the omega-3 eggs because <laughs> um, I think they just feed them flax. But you can get some good quality pastured eggs that are very nutrient dense. The egg protein is of a very high quality, very digestible, bioavailable. Um, as long as you don't have any, it can cause digestive issues for some people. But if you don't have that problem, then those can be a great source of protein and nutrients to add to the diet on a regular basis. And they also We just talked about this in our thyroid series, but if you are having issues increasing cholesterol, adding some eggs to your diet could possibly be helpful on that front. Some people does help to increase the cholesterol a little bit. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, But if you're like want to tolerate thyroid hormone and your cholesterol, adding some eggs, adding some saturated fat to the diet, having adequate carbohydrate, things like that can help you boost your cholesterol to tolerate thyroid hormone. Gotcha. Yeah, and that is not the same as saying that consumption of cholesterol increases cholesterol levels. It's much more nuanced than that. But again, I'll refer back to yeah. that or link back to that thyroid series. When it comes to eggs, one other thing to mention is they are also pretty heavily influenced by the amount of PUFA that the chickens are getting, where high PUFA-fed chickens could be above 20% PUFA, 20 to nicosine up to 25, 20, maybe even more than that, percent polyunsaturated fats, whereas the pasture-raised ones are going to be much lower, 10% you know, or lower. So that would be another area where it's important to get pasture-raised, uh, well-fed chicken, well, eggs from well-fed chickens. <laughs> uh, another yeah. protein source that we didn't mention on its own is dairy. You mentioned the protein powders from dairy, but dairy itself can be a great protein source, whether it's milk or cheese or you know yogurt, things like that. There's, of course, caveats with all these things, and I'll link back to an episode where we've talked about details when it comes to dairy and specifically milk. 
but that would be another really solid nutrient-dense protein source. To highlight again what you mentioned with the collagen, gelatin side of things, the connective tissue-based uh, proteins, again, you can get this from a bone broth. You can get this from meat that has a lot of connective tissue in it, which are generally the tougher meats that you have to cook for a long time. Different types of ribs, you know, short ribs or back ribs, different roasts, shanks, uh, you know, anything that's going to have the bone in it will typically have high amounts of gelatin as well. And getting that source of gelatin, again, whether it's from bone broth or these meats or from a collagen or gelatin powder is extremely important. We've talked about it a ton in terms of benefits for lifespan, in terms of benefits for liver health, uh, skin, hair, and nails, on and on. I mean, for reducing anxiety, there, there's so many aspects here that depend on getting enough, specifically glycine, which is the main anti-inflammatory amino acid in there, but also proline and hydroxyproline. So having a good source of these is particularly important on a consistent basis. So that would be something I want to highlight. And then one other thing from the, well, I guess, yeah, one other thing from the protein side would just be wanting to highlight the importance of some super nutrient dense sources. So if you're kind of just, I mean, if you're getting enough protein from these sources overall, you'll get a lot of nutrients, but more specifically, uh, organ meats in moderate amounts are very, very nutrient dense, whether it's liver or kidney, you know, those typically being the main ones. Those are pretty packed with nutrients. Same with oysters. Those are definitely also a nutrient powerhouse. But really, if you're getting your, if you're getting protein from these sources, they're all going to be pretty nutrient dense. So uh, this is a great source for various vitamins. Yeah, and something I want to add just quickly on the the collagen and gelatin piece. There's some research looking at glycine requirements in humans and basically showing that there's about a 0.2 gram per kilogram glycine requirement. So I took that value, I extrapolated it from the amount that they determined for, I think it was like a 150 pound person or something like that. And I wound up getting about that 0.2 gram per kilogram value. Something else that's important with that glycine value is you want to get from like a longevity perspective, as much glycine as you're getting methionine on top of that intake. So say you're, um, I don't know, say you're a 140 pound person, what you'd want to do is get... So it'll be about 13 grams. 13 grams. So say you have about 13 grams of glycine for a 140 pound person. Requirement, um, the body makes about three on average. So you want to be taking an exogenous 10. And then if, you're, if your methionine intake is, say, three grams in a day, you'd want to add another three. So you'd want to be taking in about 13 grams of glycine a day. Now, the richest sources of glycine are going to be your collagen, your gelatin, hands down. Um, so that's an easy way to bump up your glycine intake pretty significantly. Now, you don't have to like micromanage glycine on a regular basis and get exactly that much, but having that higher glycine intake is going to be extremely important for balancing methionine and also for that connective tissue anti-inflammatory, as Jay mentioned, the liver piece and whatnot. So that's kind of a value you can look at there. Um, and just like some some guidelines around shooting for that and even using supplemental glycine can be helpful as well and for like a number of issues for sleep, for liver function. If you're dealing with fatty liver, if you're dealing with blood, blood glucose dysregulation, you can use both the collagen or gelatin and the glycine concurrently to, to solve those problems and hit those targets simultaneously. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And I will link back to uh, some of the episodes where we discussed the balance between methionine and glycine and why that is. Yep. Yep. So yeah, rounding us out here when it comes to macronutrient sources, food sources, we've got the carbohydrates. And there's just like everything else, all the stipulations and context to consider here. But generally, the primary sources that we want to be using for our carbs will be ripe fruits of all different shapes and sizes. This will also include uh, both fresh fruit, but also dried fruit, maybe cooked fruit as well. And it can also include fruit juice. And then aside from that, we also have other sugar sources like honey and maple syrup and also table sugar. Just as an aside, when it comes to table sugar, of course, a lot of people will have a quite a reaction if this is the first that they're hearing of that. But I think it's helpful to consider it as basically a pure carbohydrate source in the same way that MCT oil or most fats are just a pure fat source. They don't have much nutrition. There's no nutrients with them to help you, you know, burn them for fuel, oxidize them, convert them to energy. It's just a fat source. And that's really all that uh, table sugar is as well. That's not to say that it is the equivalent of ripe fruit or anything else. There's plethora of benefits to 
ripe fruits and honey and maple syrup over table sugar. That doesn't mean that there's not any place for any amount of table sugar. And we've discussed those things previously. So I'll link back to an episode where we discussed why it's important for the fruit for the fruit to be ripe and important sources and things to consider there. I believe it was the blood sugar episode, which was in that one through seven that I mentioned earlier. So again, another reason to kind of go back and listen to those. If you're looking to optimally support your metabolism and lose weight, improve your digestion, get amazing sleep, rebalance your hormones and boost your energy, as well as so much more with clear action steps and strategies, along with personalized guidance from me, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash solution, where you can find all of the information for the Energy Balance Solution Program. This program includes customized health coaching, a video library, which includes videos on restoring gut health, losing weight without destroying your metabolism, boosting your metabolism, getting amazing restorative sleep, rebalancing your hormones, and tons more. It also includes resources like a sample meal plan and supplement guide, as well as access to a private community. So head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash solution to check out all the details. As far as some other carb sources on the uh, more of the starch side, we have squashes, you know, pumpkin, squash, zucchini, those kinds of things. We also have root vegetables, all the different types of potatoes, sweet potatoes, cassava or yuca, turnips, parsnips, carrots, those kinds of things. Uh, we also have sources like white rice, plantains. We have certain properly prepared grains, things like nixtamalized corn, or even some regular corn if you do okay with it. Maybe some traditionally prepared grains, some sprouted oats or things like that if you tolerate them. Uh, again, there's so many caveats with these things dependent on digestion, dependent on your immune function, dependent on your carbohydrate tolerance, so to speak, or how well you metabolize glucose, uh, depending on your food sources that are available. Uh, what's ripe, what's not, what season it is. So you'll want to consider all those things. And again, I'll link back to episodes where we discuss those. And uh, the last kind of category that I'll throw in here with carbs, which aren't really very carb heavy, but in general, uh, cooked vegetables would kind of fall into here as a source, not necessarily of carbohydrates, but of some nutrients, of some fiber, uh, and some polyphenols, which all have some benefits as well. Again, depending on if you digest them well and things like that, because if you don't, these can come at you know much more of a cost than a benefit. So you always want to consider that context. Yeah, and, and just for some of the, I would, so a couple of pieces, I would prioritize like the whole food carb sources and nutrient dense carb sources first um, over the, the like very easily digested, like very dense, more, I don't want to say processed, but things like table sugar, maple syrup, and honey. And the reason I say that is because I've had a couple people come to me new to this this sphere, and they've prioritized carb sources or sugar sources in their diet, which is great, but it's like tons of maple syrup and tons of honey. And as Jay kind of mentioned, it's not that they're bad sources of carbohydrates. It's that they don't have that same type of nutrient and they don't have the same amount of beneficial plant compounds that something like fruit does or even something like potatoes do. So I would kind of... I. The goal would be to create a new nutrient density is important. It is something that we're shooting for. It's not like the be all to end all that you hear in some other spheres, right? And especially because the nutrient density and other that when people talk about other spheres doesn't incorporate macronutrients, which is kind of mind blowing mm -hmm. uh, considering <laughs> there's a reason they're called macronutrients, right? They're the larger, more like extremely, uh, the largest percentage of the diet are going to be those macronutrients versus the micronutrients. But I would um, prioritize those first and then I would add in the other sources kind of second so that you can hit some of your other targets more comfortably if you say you're limited on the amounts of potatoes or, or fruit that you can eat and things, things like that on a regular basis. Another thing to keep in mind is I would try when you're first coming off low, if you are coming from low carb carnivore, you're just adding in carbs, I would try to shoot for carb sources that are low in FODMAPs and have that a one to one glucose to fructose ratio. So that in case, or if they're just glucose sources like potatoes or something, in case you have digestive issues, um, those those will help to minimize those digestive issues very specifically. So I would kind of start off on like the easily digested stuff. I would test things out as you go along. And then I would add from there. And then I would also, try, again, try to prioritize that nutrient density. Because just as an example, say you run carnivore for an extended period of time, right? 
you're probably racked up some nutrient deficiencies. I know that animal foods are nutrient dense and things along those lines, but they're really not dense in certain nutrients that could be quite important for um, for like utilizing carbohydrates and things along those lines, including potassium and, and some of the B vitamins. Now, some that's super rich in, but some you may you may not be massively rich in. So I would try to prioritize those sources so that you're able to per- use the, the carbohydrate that you're taking in and providing that nutrient that you need to use a carbohydrate simultaneously. Um, I do have a list of like soup, the most nutrient, uh, not necessarily nutrient dense, but the most easily digested carb sources in the nutrition blueprint. So like I kind of organize them in terms of things that people are more likely to tolerate versus not tolerate. Uh, because for me, that was a huge problem coming off of low carb with gut issues was what, what carb sources could I, could I handle and which ones could I not? And it took me a little bit of time to figure that out. Another thing that I want to talk about with some of the carb sources is some people may find that they do better with sugars versus starches or starches versus sugars. So that's another piece to test out. And I have had different people whose diets are based largely around potatoes, yams, plantains, things along those lines. Or I've had people whose diets are based purely around fruits, whole fruits, fruit juice, frozen fruit, and things from that perspective. So there's there's a wide range of uh, tolerance and in terms of which what carb sources work for you. And I would kind of go with what works best for you instead of any type of specific ideology around sugar is better because of X or starch is better because of X. I would prioritize what digests well, what makes you feel good, and then what also is providing you with adequate nutrients on a regular basis. Because as an example, there's our, you see like this in some of the older studies, but if you run a diet that's largely granulated sugar or largely rice or something like that, you do run the risk of running, developing nutrient deficiencies if you don't specifically try to hit certain targets. So that's something that I would, I would definitely prioritize with a carb piece. And then as far as vegetables, um, the, as I'm, I'm a fan of vegetables. They think they've been extremely helpful for modulating the microbiome and then it, by modulating the microbiome by adjusting that ecosystem allowing me to tolerate other things that previously I didn't tolerate so I think in the bioenergetic sphere like vegetables and the idea of the plant fibers are kind of left out to some extent and people opt to this idea of sterile intestine which maybe applies to the small intestine but not necessarily to the large um, I would say that plant fibers, both from fruits and also from vegetables and also some of the starch sources, starch sources are extremely beneficial in blood sugar regulation in terms of satiety, in terms of uh, lasting between meals, and then in terms of adjusting the microbiome and dealing with gut issues over, over the long term. So I would incorporate um, some cooked vegetables. However, the vegetables that I would prioritize are largely the fruit vegetables. So that's going to be your things like tomatoes, um, squashes, pumpkins, um, what is peppers, things along those lines. And then also another one that uh, perhaps it's like a newer thing that I've introduced, not, I mean, new, I guess, since the last uh, time we discussed these things, but I found that peas are something that's tolerated by people pretty well. Um, They don't really have a lot of anti-nutrients or irritative compounds, and they do provide a decent amount of plant fiber. And they, uh, another thing that can be helpful if you're coming from a heavy meat diet, the large volumes of heme iron and protein that reach the colon can cause dysbiosis for people and set them up to deal with things like hydrogen sulfide SIBO or or um, issues with protein fermentation. And I found that the legumes like peas can be helpful in managing that because you do have some of the chlorophyll going in to protect against some of the heme iron and things along those perspective. So those are other things that can be quite helpful there. So I would encourage uh, organizing a meal with some type of cooked vegetable, some type of fruit or carb source, if that's potatoes or a juice or something like that, and then actually having your protein and your meat source together. And again, I the meal construction and like which carbs to implement, um, I do have like a little setup for that for people, a little template to help them out because that was something I struggled with personally. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, so Mike, wh- where can people find that? You mentioned the nutrition blueprint. Oh, um, that is on my website. It's you any basically any of the spots on my website to at the website's mikebavenp.com. And any spots that you see to put in your email it for the nutrition blueprint, it'll be sent to you. Just go right to your email. Got it. Okay. I'll I'll definitely put a link for that. 
Yeah. So a couple things to come back to. Uh, in terms of the whole food sources versus dense ones, again, a lot of context to consider how well you're doing with carbohydrates, nutrient, you know, making sure, as you said, you're getting your nutrients and all of that. Also, digestion is a big one. Some people might not do well with whole fruits when they've got major digestive issues, even if they're low FODMAP whole fruits. It would depend. I would definitely try the low FODMAP ones first, but there's all sorts of possible uh, considerations to make. So, so, you know, some people might do really well with the more dense ones, especially also if they have very high calorie needs where it's really difficult to eat, you know, enough watermelon to get 600 grams of carbs a day, or if someone's trying to build some muscle or build, you know, gain weight or something like that, they might also want to favor the dense ones. Um, again, so those are things to consider. How good is your digestion? How do you respond to specific foods? And so we talked through a lot of those things in the digestive series, uh, the, the first few episodes and blood sugar as well. So those episodes one through seven will cover a lot of that, as well as I think we discussed the consideration of glucose and fructose ratios where it might be something to consider in very severe gut issues. You know, people who have very severe ones, most people are probably going to be fine. But again, that's why it depends on your context. Same thing with low FODMAP foods. Some people might really benefit them to favor lower FODMAP carbohydrates as they sort out some gut issues. Other people, it would actually really benefit them to include the fermentable carbohydrates, to include the fibers as a way to support their microbiome, uh, as you were kind of mentioning there when it came to vegetable. So a lot of considerations to have, but all things that are important when it comes to choosing carb sources. In terms of foods to avoid, just to kind of real quickly mention these, we've kind of alluded to all of them, but the polyunsaturated fats, which are going to be largely found in vegetable oils like soy, canola, sunflower, sesame, cottonseed, peanut oil, these are basically any processed foods that are going to be using any fat source. It tends to be these, especially in the States. Also, anything that your food is fried in at any restaurant or even just cooked in at most restaurants, it's going to be these polyunsaturated fats, which we largely want to avoid. Uh, again, talked about these extensively. I believe it was episode nine, maybe where we had a whole episode on them. So I'll link back to that. Along with that too, most of the raw vegetables are going to be largely problematic. This, and again, there are some exceptions here, which are the kind of fruit vegetables that you mentioned, bell peppers, cucumbers, tomatoes, also things like raw carrots and radishes. Those things are not going to be as offensive. They don't have very much in the way of anti-nutrients. You can still cook the bell peppers and tomatoes to uh, reduce the small amount of anti-nutrients they do have. But as a whole, uh, any other raw vegetables, especially raw leafy greens, uh, those are going to be particularly problematic, come with a whole host of, of issues, especially from the anti-nutrient side. And the same goes for typical grains, legumes, and seeds, and nuts as well that are not traditionally prepared. Again, we discussed all of these things in those earlier episodes, but just as a rule of thumb, those are we definitely don't want to be consuming considerable amounts of those the raw vegetables or the nuts, seeds, grains, and legumes that are not properly prepared to reduce the anti-nutrients. And then the last thing I mentioned on the kind of avoiding side would be additives uh, that we want to watch out for that are particularly offensive. This would be things like carrageenan, which has quite a bit of research behind it and is uh, not allowed to be put in food in various countries, and understandably so because it's been shown to be carcinogenic and cause all sorts of inflammatory effects. Uh, there's also some other additives to be aware of, things like gums and citric acid. And we've done a couple of episodes talking specifically about additives. So I'll link back to those uh, where... You know, someone can learn more about the details there. But as far as the kind of biggest one that I would say we want to avoid, carrageenan is is kind of top of the list. Some of those other ones can be okay in, in small amounts or very, you know, kind of occasional uh, moments. So it depends on the individual, but I'll link back to those episodes where we dug into those in more detail. Yeah, I think you covered the list pretty sufficiently. I mean, we've covered these all before, so I don't want to dig too much more into them, but I would just focus more on the things to incorporate. Mm -hmm. And kind of just limit the other things. That's that's the way I think about it personally. And less so about like, what is all these things I need to avoid? It's just like, what am I going to focus on actually implementing? I think that's the most effective place to spend your time and your your thoughts and energy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And throughout this whole episode, we've talked about all of the different contexts, experimentation, situations where we... If I want to lead toward one fruit over another type of fruit or something like that. There's a lot of nuances here. And that's why these are guidelines. That's why we started out by saying there aren't any rigid rules here, whether we're talking macro percentage or anything else. And again, something I want to leave listeners with is that what we're trying to determine here is what is optimal for our physiology. There's no, 
attaching our dogma to some extraneous or like outer paradigm. There's no like moralistic, you know, pre presuppositions or any superimposition of some ethnic, not ethnic, um, ethical ideas where again, we're, we're not eating certain things for some reasons that are outside of physiology. The idea here is that we are doing what makes sense based on the physiology, based on what allows us to produce energy and function better, based on the impacts on hormones, based on how our digestive systems work, you know, the things that we talk about all throughout the podcast about the physiology. And so with that in mind, there's sometimes the view coming into this that this is a diet and it's either going to work as a diet or it's not going to work as a diet. And I hope people understood throughout that this is, we, we're just putting out guidelines that are based around what is most optimal for our physiology. And that means that we have to tailor it to what we're experiencing and where our physiology is at. All the things that we've done for the years prior to this point that are going to affect us, all the things in our environment that are currently affecting us. And so what I hope people take away from this is that this is not a situation where you like try something and said, oh, you know, say like the bioenergetic diet didn't work for me. The, the point here is that this is just an exploration of our physiology and experimentation with different foods, nutrition, and other aspects of our environment based on that. And what that means is that, as we talked about, if somebody's eating 300 grams of carbs, that could fit into this quote, this paradigm, or if you want to call it a diet, even though that's the whole point is it's not. But so can somebody eating 100 grams of carbohydrates, depending on where they're coming from. That can also fit into the bioenergetic view because it's based on what is optimal for your physiology at any point in time. And something we've talked about a lot or have discussed quite a few times, you mentioned even on this episode, something where there's a bit of a divergence from a lot of other people talking in the bioenergetic world. You mentioned vegetables, that cooked vegetables can be something that are particularly beneficial. Another thing we've talked about is the the presence or absence of milk and dairy, where for some people, these things are incredibly beneficial, super nutrient dense, make a massive difference. But for other people, they actually do better off not having it, whether it's for now or 10, you know, uh, for like a couple of months or a period of time. And that can also fit into the bioenergetic view. You can have a diet that looks very different. Maybe it includes a lot of vegetables, no milk, not that many carbs, you know, and that can still perfectly fit in here. So I I just yeah, want to leave people with some things to kind of chew on there and to reiterate the fact that this is not a situation where there's any kind of dogma to any particular food, type of food, macronutrient or things like that, but rather we want to focus on the principles that come around or come out as a result of understanding the physiology and then adjust our environment in all the different ways to lead to our best uh, route forward for health and experiment in that direction. And, and that's really what the bioenergetic yeah, I the way I just have a quick summary of it, I see it as a journey implementing principles to improve your physiology. And so how that those principles play out are going to vary person to person, it's going to be individual, and it's it's there's not like a one that's why I kind of describe it as like 0.0, 0.1, 0 0.2, there's going to be iterations, there's going to be adjustments what we work for you in this context is going to adjust as your body changes. So it's your the goal moves from becoming part of this dogma or this ideology or this or that into what are these principles from the fit? Like, what are these basic principles that come out of the research that are kind of to, to a degree standard across, across humans, across uh, understanding of physiology in general? And how can we apply those to improve our life? Whether that's things around the microbiome, things around cellular energy metabolism, things around digestion, things around mineral balance. How can we take these different elements, incorporate them into a way that works specifically for us as the individual? and move forward. And then the only way to really know in the long run is test it out. And that, that, that could be lab testing, that could be genetic testing, but really it's what are you doing in your everyday life and how are those things affecting your outcomes, your bottom line, your functions, and all of these things. And that's what we're really looking at instead of like, this, here's a diet. If this doesn't work, like you, there's something wrong with you or whatnot. It's like, no, here are principles and let's taper these and tailor these things to your context. That's the ultimate outcome and test and adjust and test and adjust and test and adjust. And I think that's the really the only way, I mean, going through the different contexts, both of us, that we found out what's working for us, what's working for clients, what's working for different people. That's the process that we're going through is, and it's not this like very rigid situation. It's like a adaptable, living, adjusting process. All right. I hope you enjoyed that series on building a bioenergetic diet. 
If you did, please leave a like or comment if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening elsewhere, please leave a review or five star rating on iTunes. All of those things really do a lot to help support the podcast and are very much appreciated. To check out the show notes from today's episode, you can head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcasts, where you can take a look at the studies and articles and anything else that we referenced throughout today's episode. And if you are looking to resolve various low energy symptoms, whether that's chronic cravings and hunger, low energy or fatigue, chronic pain, weight gain, digestive symptoms, brain fog, poor sleep, hormonal imbalances, or any other chronic health issue or chronic health condition, then head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy, where you can sign up for a free energy balance mini course, where I'll walk you through the main things that you want to do from a diet and lifestyle perspective to maximize your cellular energy and resolve these symptoms and conditions. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy. And with that, I'll see you in the next episode.